Okay, thanks very much. Um, it's very kind that you're holding this conference in, in this mixed format so that uh, those of us who are far away can still participate. Um, and it's nice to see, see lots of people I know and lots of people I don't know, don't yet know, hope to know soon. Um, so before I get started, uh, I'm going to write on slides. The blank slides that haven't been written on are available here if you want to take your own notes. And if you want to have a copy, maybe they'll be posted to the conference later, I don't know, but there's, they're available here filled in. So you can also scroll back and forward and see the future and so on. Um, so uh, I'm excited to tell you about some joint work with Shutrit Sharkar um, about Kavan homology for non-orientable surfaces and force space. Um, the plan is, well, I'm gonna construct a, an invariant of non-orientable cobordisms in four space that's inspired by a construction in um, Hagard flare homology. So it's a sort of secondary invariant using the fact that some uh, primary invariant vanishes. Um, so that's what the first half of the talk is about, is about that construction um, in a few steps. Then the second half, I'm gonna talk about some applications. Well, actually most of the applications are the almost all of the applications you can get from um, a more primitive invariant of non-orientable surfaces. So the second half is sadly a little bit independent from the first half, although I'll connect them. So I'll start with talking about some properties and then, then uh, some results about non-orientable surfaces. Okay. Um, ah, and I didn't think about the format before I, uh, before I started, before I prepared the talk. So it's a there's a chance that my writing will be too small on the screen. And if so, please tell me and I'll adjust somehow and write bigger. So I'm not, I think for remote people, it will be fine, but for in-person people, I'm not, maybe it'll be small. So in-person people should complain. Um, okay, embedded surfaces in space. Uh, so um, just a little bit about non-orientable surfaces to fix some some terminology notation. So, excellent. Um, so a surface not supposed to be both. A surface, uh, so given a, a bunch of copies of RP2, um, minus a bunch of disks. Okay, any non, any compact non-orientable surface can be described this way for some uh, number C. So C is what I'm going to call the cross cap number. Uh, sometimes it's called the non orientable genus, but there's some confusion in the terminology there. So um, this seems good. And I'm not going to assume that surfaces are necessarily connected. So if you have a disconnected surface, disjoint union of surfaces CR sorry, fi, then the cross cap number is just going to be this, I'm going to define to be the sum. So the sum of the cross cap number of the individual surfaces. Um, okay. Um, for a surface embedded in four space, so this is one invariant of a surface, for a surface embedded in four space is a second algebra topological invariant. So um, if f sits inside 0, 1 cross R3 or 0, 1 cross um, S3, um, say it's connecting two knots. So it's a cobordism from um, zero cross L zero to one cross L one. Um, well, you can choose a um, vector field V um, on F, um, which restricts to the Seifert framing on the boundaries. So V restricted to I cross LI is the Seifert framing. So is points along the Seifert surface. Then um, the signed count of the zeros of V um, is a number called the uh, normal Euler number 
um, of the surface F and it's written E of F, or we'll write it E of F, normal Euler number. And if you haven't seen this before, then you think signed count for a non-orientable surface, that doesn't make sense. But the point is that you can choose an orientation locally and then that assigns a sign. If you reverse the orientation locally, then that reverses both the orientation of the surface and of its push off. So the sign doesn't change. So this is actually a well-defined number. And it turns out to be independent of the choice of vector field. Um, okay. Um, this number behaves in a simple way under for simple cabordism. So if you have a um, planar saddle, um, say uh, like this, I'll draw a non-orientable one. So um, where the saddle is just a, a band that's being attached there. Um, the Euler number of this cabordism is just the difference in writhes. The way the, I think, usual signs work out is it's the writhe before minus the writhe after. Um, and then it's additive, the normal Euler number is additive under uh, composition of cabordisms. So um, it's pretty easy to compute. Uh, for example, uh, if we take the trefoil, um, Here's a, there's a cabordism from the trefoil to the unknot where I just do a saddle there. So I'll draw the unknot over here, hopefully. Um, great. And now if I want to compute the, let's make this part bigger so that people on the screen can see it. Um, if we want to compute the uh, Euler number, I need to, to or rather the rise, it's helpful to choose an orientation. Um, let's see, this is a positive crossing and this is a positive crossing and this is a positive crossing. Then I'll choose an orientation again, just arbitrarily over here. Uh, and if we look at the crossings, uh, this is a negative crossing and a negative crossing and a negative crossing. So um, this is an Euler number um, six cabordism, the right before minus the right after. Here the right was three, and here the right is minus three. Um, another example, um, you could have a uh, birth of an unknot. So here's an unknot, um, and then do a saddle. Um, so that gives me another unknot. Uh, and then have that unknot go away again. So adaptive and unknot, this is, uh, let's see, this is rise equal to one. And this is, uh, I should orient it so you can see that. Doesn't matter how here, there, um, there, there. And if I orient this one again, it doesn't matter how, there, there, there. So this was a positive crossing. This is now a negative crossing. And so this is rise minus one. So this is an Euler number two, um, RP2. Um, RP2 just tells by looking at the Euler characteristic. Okay. Um, I'm also in a few minutes gonna need a little bit about curves on, orient on non-orientable surfaces. And there are two different properties that they can have um, that I wanna single out. So um, non-orientable surfaces have um, one-sided and two-sided curves. Um, so here, by one-sided or two-sided, I mean locally one-sided or two-sided. So let's draw an example. This is a locally two-sided curve. Um, sorry, this is two-sided. Um, I'll again make it bigger so that it's easier to see on the screen. Uh, this is a uh, one-sided curve. Um, 
Um, here's another one-sided curve. Uh, let's go around this handle. So this is also one-sided. Meaning that if you look at the um, neighborhood of a neighborhood of the curve of surface, either it looks like an annulus or it looks like a Mobius band. Um, okay, and then uh, curves can be some type complement orientable or complement non orientable. Meaning, either they use up all of the non orientableness of the surface or they don't. Um, this one, the red one, is complement orientable. Because if you delete the curve, then the complement is orientable. If you, I mean, the surface minus the curve is orientable. Whereas this other one sided curve here is the green one is complement non orientable. Even if you delete uh, a neighbor to the curve, the surface remains non orientable. Um, and last thing I wanted to say, just to emphasize, um, surfaces are not required to be connected um, for this talk. Okay, non orientable surfaces. Um, next, I wanted. Hi, yeah. can I ask the question? Um, in the previous picture, Please. when you um, deleted a neighborhood of the red arc, what exactly do you mean you're deleting? Oh, just delete the red arc, and then the complement in the, so the surface becomes orientable. Just like if you take a Mobius band and you cut it around the middle, you get an annulus. Oh, that, sorry, it's the green one that's complement non orientable. Okay, thank you. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Okay, thanks. No, thank you. More questions? Okay, on we go. Um, I'm going to use a slightly strange uh, formulation of or slightly unusual formulation of Kavana homology, the form Kavana homology. So let me say what that is um, very briefly. Whoops. So um, I'm going to work over um, the polynomial ring Q adjoint T, and in constructing this deformed Kavana homology is really the Lie deformation. We'll use the Frobenius algebra um, Q adjoin xt mod x squared equals t um, with co multiplication um, given by um, delta of 1 is 1 tensor x um, plus x tensor 1, and delta of uh, x is x tensor x. Uh, sorry, plus t times one tensor one. So if you set t equal to one, you get the Lee Frobenius algebra as people usually think about it. Um, but I want to record the t is somehow recording the change in quantum filtration, maybe. Um, and then from this, okay, you construct Kavanov or the form Kavanov complex in the usual ways. So you take a knot diagram. I'm going to say this quickly because I think the audience knows this. You form the cube of resolutions. Okay, there's a cube of resolutions. You place circles by copies of V. I mean, you feed it into this TQFT, the merges and splits are replaced by the multiplication or co-multiplication. You take the total complex of that cube. And I mean, after assigning some, you know, put some signs to take the total, to make it non-commuter, take the total complex. Um, and then that's the Kavanaugh of complex. I'm going to denote that C minus of L. Um, and just to make that a little bit more familiar, here's what that looks like for, uh, so I should say T has bi-grading. Um, uh, so T has bi-grading um, zero minus four. And then here's what that complex looks like just for the trefoil. So um, that's over here. So I've got three generators after you, you know, cancel off what you can cancel off to you. Um, simplify as much as possible. We've got three generators, uh, A, B, and C, and the differential of C, oh, sorry, four generators, A, B, C, and D, good job. 
and the differential of C is T times D. And so if you set T equal to one, um, this whole thing collapses. And if you um, leave, uh, uh, and you set T equal to zero, you get the ordinary Kavanaugh uh, complex, you get the ordinary Kavanaugh homology. Um, so again, just to sort of make sure that we're on the same page, the invariant of the empty link is Q adjoint T. Um, the invariant of the unknot is um, two copies of Q adjoint T. I haven't put in the gradings for Q adjoint T plus Q adjoint T. Um, Treffler is on the right. Uh, the differential um, takes, uh, I'm going to, I mean, with the grading conventions, I'm going to use this as um, by degree one, zero. So, okay. Um, from this, there's some simple algebraic operations you can do. You, this, so this is again, sort of inspired by constructions and definitions in Hegart flow theory. So you can invert T, um, uh, sorry, C minus of L. Um, you can, then there's an inclusion of C minus into this C infinity. So you can look at the quotient. So that's just C infinity. Um, mod C minus. Um, and we won't actually, we won't use it much, but the analog of the Hegard flow group HF hat would be C hat of L, which is just, um, you set T equal to zero. So C minus of L mod T, C minus of L. So this is the usual Kavanov complex. Um, so, Inverting T, that would add an element T inverse A, T inverse B, T the minus two A, et cetera, up here, and an element um, T inverse C there, and so on. And um, the plus, so that's the infinity version, and the plus version, you would only look at the stuff with negative T power. So up here is the plus. Um, so there's a short exact sequence, zero to C minus of L to um, C infinity of L just by uh, construction to C plus of L to zero, which gives you a long exact sequence on homology. Uh, so my homology I'm gonna denote with H is so H minus of L to H infinity of L to H plus of L to, um, H minus of L. Um, okay. And one more variant is you can look at the um, kernel uh, of the map from H minus to H infinity, H minus of L to H infinity of L. Um, so that's the kernel of this arrow. Um, that's the same, of course, since it's an exact sequence of the co as a co-kernel from H infinity of L to um, H plus of L. Um, and I'm going to call that H reduced. Uh, this has nothing to do with reduced Kavanaugh homology in the usual sense. It's similar to, again, the, the terminology we're taking is from Hagar first. So this is its analog to what's called. So this is like what's called HF red in Hegard flair theory, and we're going to use it later. But it's not, there's no base point. It's not reduced to the, you know, it's not, doesn't correspond to reduced Jones polynomial or anything. Um, and, uh, okay, if you don't like the Q coefficients, the, everything I'm going to say works, sorry, works similarly um, for the Barnaton deformation. So for the Barnaton deformation over Z or any field. Okay. Um, so there's our weird formulation, a slightly non-standard formulation of Kavanaugh homology. Uh, Kavanaugh homology is functorial. So um, let me write my version of that statement and then I'll just comment briefly on the history to give people, give some people appropriate credit. So given a possibly non-orientable possibly non-orientable 
um, cabordism F inside 0, 1 cross S3 from uh, a link L0 um, to 1 cross L1. Is this so? Okay, now I'm doing this writing. Is this visible on the big screen in person? Can in person people see this? Yes. Okay. I'm. Thanks. That's really good to know. I was, I was worried. Thanks. Um, I once went to talk by somebody who I won't name who was decided to write blue on black. So the whole talk was projected blue on black, and it was completely impossible to see anything. Um, uh, so given a Kabor-Pasian algorithm of Kabordism, there is an induced map. Um, induced map. Um, uh, uh, let me write it H bullet of F from um, H bullet uh, of uh, L0 to H bullet of L1 for bullet in um, plus minus uh, infinity or hat. Um, okay, I left some space, I'm gonna write in the grading. So H bullet I J of L0 goes to H bullet I minus E over two um, J plus chi minus three E, that's a three over two. Um, there's some grading shift. That's the most confusing part of the story. Great. Uh, well defined um, up to sign. Um, and the functor, so such that H bullet of the identity cabordism is the identity, well, plus or minus the identity, and um, uh, H bullet of. Uh, F prime circle F is H bullet of F prime circle H bullet of F. And um, if F is equivalent to F prime, then um, H bullet of F is equal to plus or minus H bullet of F prime. Um, what is it? What do I mean by equivalent? This you won't be clear why, but this turns out to be important. So um, equivalent means here, if there's a diffeomorphism phi from 0, 1 cross S3 to itself, such that on the boundary, it's the identity. So uh, on the boundary identity and um, phi of F equals F prime. So in particular, if the two surfaces are smoothly isotopic or ambiently isotopic, at smoothly ambiently isotopic, then, then this holds. But this is maybe a little bit weaker than that. I think it's actually not known if it's, if it's weaker than that or not. Um, so I'm not going to prove this, but let me just say a few words so that the many people who were involved get some, some credit. So um, up to isotopy. Um, every surface um, is represented um, by a movie of by a movie of Reidemeister moves, births, deaths, and saddles, um, and saddles. And so you just need to you need to define a map for each. Ridomized to move birth, death, and saddle. And I mean, the fact that we're looking at non orientable cabordisms means that your uh, saddles can either be orientable saddles or non orientable saddles. But um, other than the gradings, the maps don't actually notice that. So the maps in Kabanov homology are defined, you know, don't use the, the orientation at all, unless you're tracking the grading shifts. Um, and then, okay, for invariance, you have, uh, sorry, for invariance in 0, 1 cross R3, uh, with respect to 
up to isotopy anyway, so for isotopy invariance, you just need to check uh, invariance under Carter Sido's movie moves. Um, and so that was done by Jacobson by just checking all the moves. And then Kavanov and Barnaton shortcut that by using the fact that it extends the tangles to prove that many of the moves you don't have to check, almost all of them. Um, and then for invariance in 0, 1 cross S3 and the stronger statement about equivalent cabordisms, cabordisms that I made, um, you also have to check uh, Morrison Walker, sorry, Morrison. Oh, I've got the names backwards. That's terrible. Morrison Walker Vedrick. I can't believe I did that. Let's fix that in real time. Can't do that on a chalkboard. I can't believe I did that. And now my three is out of place. Okay, there goes my three. You need to check Morrison Walker Vedrick's um, sweep around move. Uh, which they checked in a relatively recent paper, 2019-ish. Um, okay, and that's all I'm gonna say about the proof. Um, couple of remarks. Uh, for orientable cabordisms, the sign ambiguity has been studied well and fixed, and there are a couple of different approaches to that. Um, for non-orientable uh, cabordisms, the strategies that existed, it wasn't clear to us that they work. So, um, and maybe they don't. So I don't know if the sign, I don't know if it's possible to fix the sign ambiguity. Um, related to that and to one of the strategies and something I'll use later is a theorem of uh, Rasmussen's. Um, in his paper, he's talking the S invariant, um, well, a corollary, I guess, of a theorem of his, is that if F is non-orientable, then the induced map um, on the T inverted theory uh, vanishes. So uh, from H infinity of L0 to H infinity of L1 vanishes. And um, this is where the Q coefficients becomes important. Everything else I said so far is fine with any coefficients. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about functoriality of cohomology. Okay, um, the vanishing. This theorem is going to be. This is sort of saying the primary invariant, at least in the infinity version, associated with non-orientable cohomology vanishes. Um, and that's what we're going to use in order to construct this uh, refined invariant, this mixed invariant. But I need one more ingredient first. So an analog of what's called in Hagard for theory an admissible cut. Um, uh, so uh, for a cobordism f from L0 to L1 with cross cap number um, at least two, an admissible cut um, is just a decomposition into two cobordisms. So of F as a composition F1 composed with F0, say along a link L in the middle, um, such that both sides are non-orientable. So F0 and F1 are both non-orientable. Um, uh, and I need a, I'm going to use an inertia equivalence of these. So two admissible cuts are, uh, let's say, along L and L prime. L and L prime are equivalent 
if um, they're either diffeomorphic, that is, there's one of these diffeomorphisms like in the definition of equivalence before, half of S3 cross I, or I cross S3 to itself, which is at any on the boundaries and takes one admissible cut to the other, or disjoint. So um, if you had a, say, a cross cap number three cobordism, so I'm going to draw cross caps as sort of shaded circles. Um, and you cut it along some link there or along some link there, those would be equivalent admissible cuts. Um, uh, okay, theorem. Um, if uh, F has cross cap number at least two, um, an admissible cut exists. And if F has cross cap number at least three, all admissible cuts are equivalent. Um, so I'll say a word about the proof there. Um, so how to construct an admissible cut? Well, there are lots of ways to do it, but the following will be convenient for B. Um, choose a complement non-orientable um, one-sided curve uh, curve gamma. Um, inside F. So I've drawn a schematic over here on the right. Uh, this shaded disk is a cross cap, and here's a curve gamma that's non-orientable, but complement, uh, complement non-orientable and one-sided. Here's a, not a one-sided curve, and it's complement, so it's complement non-orientable. Um, OK. Uh, Consider everything to the left of gamma. So C less than equal to gamma is going to be a set of pairs T, P um, in 0, 1 cross S3, such that um, there exists S in 0, 1 with um, S bigger than T and um, S comma P is in gamma, uh, S bigger than or equal to T, I guess. So this C less than equal to gamma, that's sort of everything to the left of gamma. Um, and, okay, uh, sorry. Let's let U be a neighborhood of C less than equal to gamma and uh, perturb the surface so that um, C less than equal to gamma is well, as disjoint from F as possible, it just intersects F and gamma. Okay, so there are no other intersections to the left. That's true generically. Um, then um, the decomposition along boundary U, uh, oh, sorry, wrong. That's not what I want U to be. A neighborhood of such that neighborhood of C less than or equal to gamma, union um, zero cross S3. So U, let's make it in green. U is a neighborhood of the left side here. And also um, uh, this a neighborhood of the C less than or equal to gamma. Okay, that's a little bit hard to, to read now. Um, then decomposing along boundary U is an admissible cut. Um, well, to the left is, I mean, the interior, I mean, it's the left side, which is just U, there's a non-orientable, the service intersects in a non-orientable service because it contains gamma and gamma is one-sided. But the fact that gamma was complement non-orientable means that there's also a one-sided curve that's not in U. 
and so the right side is is also uh, uh, non-orientable. Okay, so that proves the existence of admissible cuts. Um, where did we use the hypothesis that the cross cap numbers, at least two, it was to know that there exists a complement non-orientable one-sided curve. I thought it isn't true for cross cap number one. Um, B, uh, well, to, to prove this, this takes more work, but any admissible cut is equivalent to one as in A. So you can just restrict to admissible cuts as in A. Um, and if I did the construction from A along disjoint um, curves, gamma or eta, that gives me equivalent cuts. Um, so the result follows from um, knowing that I can get from any complement non-orientable one-sided curve to another by passing between curves that are disjoint. Um, so um, that's a version of the curve complex um, connectedness of the complement non-orientable uh, one-sided curve complex. Um, okay. Okay. And so now I can finally tell you the definition of the in mixed invariant, the, the point of this talk. Should I pause for questions? Questions? No. On we go. Okay. So um, fix a uh, surface F with cross cap number um, at least two, say, and decompose it as F1 composed with F0 along a link L uh, via an admissible cut. Um, then let's see. Um, I have um, this uh, Q brackets T module H minus L0, and it was factorial. So there's a map associated to, a, to uh, F0 to H minus of L. And my cavoidism looks like um, I had uh, L0, there's some cross cap in there to L to um, L1, there's a cross cap in there. Um, uh, there's a map from that to, uh, there was a long exact sequence involving H minus H infinity and H plus. So there's a map from there to H infinity of L0. Um, and that goes to H infinity of L. And this theorem of Rasmussen tells us that this map is zero. So in particular, that map is also zero. Um, the kernel of the map over here on the right, that's H red. That's this reduced uh, uh, complex that I mentioned. Um, and the fact that the, I mean, going over and down vanishes means that there exists a lift here. So um, great. Uh, H red was also the co-kernel of the map from H infinity to H plus. Okay. Um, Great. Uh, and now I can look at the second half of the cobordism. That's H um, plus of L, uh, sorry, of F1. Okay. And there's also map H infinity of F1. Uh, oh, but that vanishes again by Rasmussen. because F1 was non-orientable. Okay, so down and over is zero. And that tells me that um, this map, so that the map from H plus of L to H plus of L1 descends to a map to A from H red from the descends the co-kernel. So 
um, that exists. And this is this mixed invariant. So this is what we denoted phi of f, the mixed invariant. Um, okay, and then if f has cross cap number at least three, um, phi of f um, is independent of the choice of admissible cut. Um, and again, just a word about the proof. So this turns out to be easy from things I've said before. So from this strong version of functoriality that used the um, Morrison-Walker-Vedrick theorem um, and equivalence of um, all admissible cuts. That's the theorem for the previous slide that used the curve complex. Okay. End of the construction. So that's the end of part one. So I'll talk about properties and applications. Um, this is uh, the picture, by the way. So I wanted a picture of a property application. The closest I could come was a, a model of a, of a house. The pictures from, there's this wonderful website, Unsplash, that has free stock photos. So if you never need stock photos of something, Unsplash is great, um, completely free. Maybe you're supposed to give credit, which I'm doing. Um, a uh, little bit about properties of the, of the invariant. Ah, uh, sorry. So S stands for if you put in some dots. So let's ignore the S. You're like, you can do carbonisms with dots on them, but I haven't talked about that. So let's ignore that. Okay, the first thing you wonder is what's the grading shift? So I wrote down the grading shifts here. Um, the grading shift, I actually wrote this one down before on H minus, has to do with the you know, Euler down with the Euler characteristic. And then there's a the connecting homomorphism in this exact sequence shows up for the mixed invariant, so it's off by one. It's grading from, from H minus. I should have asked Paolo before I'm drinking a cappuccino. I'm not sure if you're allowed to drink cappuccinos when it's the afternoon in Italy. Um, so, uh, okay. Uh, we had hoped, so if F is closed, the map on H minus vanishes if it's non-orientable. Um, that's easy from Rasmussen's result. We'd hoped that we were going to get an invariant of closed services, but with some work, I mean, it's quite fiddly, but we're able to prove that um, the mixed invariant also vanishes for closed connected surfaces. Maybe I should circle that. Um, we don't know whether it vanishes for closed disconnected surfaces. That might be that would be interesting, um, perhaps. Uh, for non-orientable surfaces, um, there are a couple of kinds of uh, stabilization operations you can do. One is you can take a connect sum with a local to uh, a local torus, just take a four ball on the standard torus is how to take a connect sum. That kills off both of these invariants. Another thing you can do is you can just attach a one handle, but maybe in a way that knots up uh, any one handle to the surface, but maybe in a way that knots with the rest of the surface. So you can knot a, an arc and a surface you can knot inside for space. Um, there, the naive invariant, the map on, on uh, H minus vanishes, but we don't know about the mixed invariant. So again, it's conceivable you could use this to see that some uh, stabilizations are not standard, though we don't have examples of that. Um, these things vanish for connected sums um, under hypotheses you need for them to be defined. Um, uh, connect sums with non randomable services, and they're both unchanged if you take connected sums with two spheres, including knotted two spheres. So connected, you, these are measuring sort of really global knotting, not connecting in a local knotted two sphere, where even a big knotted two sphere doesn't change it. Okay. Um, Do you have examples um, of which the invariant is uh, actually no. non-zero? I do have examples for which the invariant is non-zero. I'm so glad you asked. That's this slide um, and also the next slide. Um, so these, uh, these invariants have been, so the Kavanaugh invariants of services have gotten a lot of attention recently. There's actually a somewhat old thesis of Jonah Swan a decade ago where he gave the first examples of services that are distinguished by Kavanaugh homology. Um, 
And those surfaces are here, the surfaces from his thesis. And then the uh, results were expanded in a joint paper with Isaac Sandberg, who I think is graduating this year. Um, so uh, here are two different slice disks for the knot 946. You can, you start with, okay, with nothing. You give birth to, this is a pair of unknots, this diagram, so is this one. Um, I'm not sure if that's obvious, but, but you, can, you can unlink these two things, it's just a pair of unknots. And then you attach a handle there or a handle there. And, uh, uh, okay, so here are two different surfaces, two different slice disks for the knot 946. Um, and they proved that these are different. Well, um, what do they do? They actually showed that um, the map associated on H hat associated C composed of sigma L is zero, but the map associated to C composed of sigma R is non-zero. So the maps associated sigma L and sigma R are different. Where C is what C? C is the bottom cobordism, which you get by attaching three um, handles where I just drew these, these uh, blue arcs. So um, that's a cobordism too. Uh, the trefoil connects on its mirror, three one connects on the mirror of three one. Um, okay. Uh, so this is actually a cross cap number three cobordism. Uh, so corollary, C composed with sigma L is not isotopic to C composed with sigma R. Um, uh, so these have cross cap number three. That's easy. That's these um, three blue things I drew are all non orientable handles, uh, non orientable uh, yeah, handles, um, sandals, that's the word I wanted, and Euler measure minus six. Um, and the boundary. Uh, is, as I said, 3, 1 connects up, the trefoil connects up the mirror of the trefoil. Um, corollary is that um, uh, C composing R is not a uh, connect sum with an RP2, so not um, some other surface connect sum RP2, which I think wasn't actually, wasn't known, although I'm not sure any of you had tried to prove it. Um, another corollary is that um, phi of the mixed invariant of phi of C circle sigma R is non-zero, but the mixed invariant of C composed with sigma L is zero. And the proof um, is some algebra combined with the fact that the differential, the, the connecting homomorphism applied to the mixed invariant is the same as the map on H hat. So that's not zero for sigma R. So this is, this connecting homomorphism is going from H plus to H hat. Um, that's not the long sex sequence I wrote down before, it's a different one. Um, and then the second half, um, you use that plus the, just you write down the form of, uh, the Kavana homology of 3, 1 connects on M3, 1. Okay, so not only is it sometimes non-zero, it does distinguish some surfaces. Uh, I don't have a lot of time left, so let me give you one more example briefly. Um, so uh, a pair of surfaces F and F prime inside 0, 1 cross S3 are an exotic pair. Um, if they're homeomorphic, so there's a homeomorphism free from 0, 1 cross S3 to itself with um, phi is the identity on the boundary and phi of F equals F prime, but no diffeomorphism with this form. So you can turn one to the other by a homeomorphism, fixing boundary, but no diffeomorphism. Um, so Hayden Sandberg enhanced the ideas in the previous slide and use, using an example of Hayden's from before, showed that um, these two slice disks, um, 
are an exotic pair. What two slice disks? You either, you take this knot, this is 12 and 300, uh, sorry, this is something, this is some 17 crossing knot, some big knot, I forget, 17 NH something. And you either attach a, a saddle there or you attach a saddle there and that unknots the whole thing. It turns it into a two component unlink and then you fill those in with disks. So, um, okay, those are two slice disks. Um, the way they proved it is um, the image of um, this class, um, uh, sorry, not this class, this class uh, in common homology distinguishes them. Um, okay. Um, a corollary of that is that um, here are two, an exotic pair of RP of uh, genus, sorry, cross gap number three surfaces, RP2 connects sum, RP2 connects sum, RP2 minus D2s. Um, so that's these um, are exotic. Um, uh, that's the pictures are here. So maybe I'll, instead of telling you the proof, I'll say something about the, the pictures. So um, you attach, here are three non-orientable saddles. You attach those three and then either the blue or the red. Um, okay. And uh, okay, these two are distinguished by um, H hat or phi. So again, this either the invariant H hat or the invariant phi distinguishes exotic pairs of non-orientable surfaces. Um, one last slide and then one comment. Um, there are a lot of open questions. Um, the example I gave are a bit of a swindle. The, I didn't need the fancy mixed invariant to distinguish them. The more naive map on H minus distinguished them. So a question that we don't know the answer to is are there any pairs that are detected by the mixed invariant but not the map on H minus? I imagine the answer is yes, but that would be nice to have an actual example. Or maybe the answer is no. Um, we don't know if this vanishes for closed disconnected services. You could find links of RP2s, three component link of RP2s, which maybe, which uh, are distinguished by phi. Um, it can also distinguish some stabilizations of say some Mobius bands, some uh, big, some non-standard stabilizations. That would be interesting. Um, I don't know if any examples of that are known in the literature by other techniques. Um, uh, the next one's a little silly, so I'll drop that. And the last one is, okay, is there, you know, this was inspired by construction of Hagard Fleur's I would wouldn't Fleur. And we wonder if there's a connect, an actual connection. Although I don't have a proposed connection, I don't have a guess. Um, that's all I was going to say. Um, thanks for listening. Um, one last comment is um, this picture and the picture on the first slide are actually made using the same software. So um, I'm very impressed with this piece of software. Okay, thanks very much. Questions, uh, Georgians or Zoom? Can I ask you expect something similar in Nuttler homology, the unoriented version? That's a good question. Um, we that would be nice. We don't know how to do that, and the thing that's missing is the analog of of Jake's theorem that the map on H infinity associated non-orientable services service vanishes. So there's a uh, extension of Nuttler homology to non-orientable cohortisms first. Well, the invariance wasn't proved at first looked at by Arjvastu Tristal and then by a student of Ciprian's. Um, ah, how fei fan. How fei fan. I knew that. Sorry. Um, but the map on HFK infinity is non zero always there, I think. And that sort of makes sense because you can forget from HFK infinity down to HF infinity. Uh, and then you don't, then you're just looking at SD cross I. So, so it's not surprising that map is non-zero even for non-randomal cohortisms, but we would need a variant where the map vanishes. 
That would be interesting because maybe you could prove some more stuff like looking at stabilizations or getting invariance of closed surfaces maybe. So that would be a great project, but we don't know how to do it. Okay, look, I'm sorry, one more uh, question. Uh, can you say uh, a few words about why the invariant is zero for connected closed surfaces? Yes, I can try. Um, so, um, It's tricky. Uh, I think the answer is no. I don't remember it well enough to summarize it. Sorry. Right. It, it was the, it's one of these, Shutri came up with a proof. That's my excuse. I did actually understand it. The, uh, you mess around with the gradings and you see that the map, that the, I mean, the, the, you, so the map, ha you, for grading reasons, it vanishes for connected services, except um, Euler number minus two RP3 connects some RP3 connects some RP3. It's just because you see that either the homological grading code gets changed too much or the quantum grading gets uh, changed too much. So you're sort of down to one case. And then in that case, you, mess around with the exact sequences relating H minus and H infinity and use the fact that H, I mean, if you know the map on H infinity for um, from the empty link or from the odd not to itself, then you know the map on H minus because the thing is free and, uh, and then there's some mild trickery and you get the result. But um, yeah, it was, it's sort of, it's tricky. I think it's correct. Um, that gives us some hope that if you did a similar story for something else, like not flare homology or, I don't know, SL3 homology or something, maybe the map would see closed surfaces because it it's so, was so fiddly to prove that it vanishes for closed surfaces that then maybe if you change the story a little bit, the whole proof just collapses and it doesn't vanish. So I, I view it the fact that that proof was a mess as sort of a feature. <laughs> So I have another question. So how difficult is it to compute phi? So do, do are you using programs or until how many crossings is? You how do we how do we compute it? Um, that's a good question. Um, we haven't. So there are no good programs that I know of for computing maps on Kavanaugh homology associated with cobordism. So there are a few sort of partial programs that are not very friendly and probably not very fast. And there's a there's a conceptual question there also, like how do you write a good program for doing that? You need to, you know, some divide and conquer and so on. Um, for these computations, it's just by hand. Isn't that amazing? So this is a Sunberg Swan. Again, we're, we're sort of leveraging computations other people did. We just tweak them a little bit. So we don't deserve much, if any, credit for that. But um, they just explicitly write down a class here. They choose some resolutions and you see that, well, let me take this one, I've got the class. Here's a knot, it's a monstrously big knot. Here's a class and it's Kavanaugh homology. How do you know it's a, the dashes are the places that you did zero resolutions. So those are the ones that are still gonna happen. So how do you know this is a class where all of the dashes are merges and they're between circles labeled X. So this is our cycle. And then, they just track, you know, there's, they track where does it go under some cobordism to be unknown. Is that true? Um, just yeah? yeah, just Kavanaugh homology. So it's, Kavana yeah. And, and phi, so it's. Phi then, um, so you can see that they're distinguished by phi by some trickery involving, some messing around involving the exact sequences. So there's a, um, there's a map, there's a, a sequence H plus to H plus to H hat. This is like multiplication by T. Uh, maybe I should have put the, the H hat is naturally the kernel. I mean, it's a, it's a exact triangle, but still. Um, and so there's a connecting homomorphism here and the connecting homomorphism applied to phi is the map on um, H hat. 
So in particular, phi is at least as strong as the map on H hat. So anything that's distinguished by um, H hat is gonna be distinguished by phi. Uh, and then you can leverage it to see that, that phi, so that implies phi is non-zero if the map on H hat was non-zero. And then you sort of stare at the form of the homology and you see that in this case, if eight, the map in H hat was zero, then phi is also zero. Um, just by, there was no non-zero thing it could be that, that would allow H hat to be zero. Yeah. Uh, Jack, maybe it's still a suggestion, but so you define phi using uh, this cap, and, but it, it is zero when the cap number is at least three. But so maybe you need to use two cuts and have a next level in there. Um, that's a good idea. Um, uh, maybe the, the you would have to be so that the in the definition the, the so the complication is that our proof that it's zero when cross cut numbers these three is a, is complicated and use effects the service was closed. So um, Yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't immediately know how to do what you proposed, but why not? I mean, you sort of stare at the proof that it's zero for closed surfaces, and then see systematically why that was forced to be zero, and maybe you can get a, a third order invariant that's non-zero. That's worth thinking about. That's a good idea. Well, okay, I can. Any other questions? So, uh, well, thanks uh, for that again. Thanks very much.